Hello, Neil from Dagon and Move here. Today is an instructional video for Pacific Tide, a two-player strategic level war game set during the Pacific Theatre of World War II. The game covers the entirety of that campaign from the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 through to the dropping of the atomic bomb in 1945. One side will play, play as the Americans, the other side will play as the Japanese. And although it is a two-player game, it is card-driven, the game does include a solo assistant to allow the solo player to, to navigate managing both sides a little bit more easily than purely playing two-handed. You do need to know how to play the main game in order to do that, so the instructions for the solo assistant are at the very end of this video. So stay tuned, watch the beginning of the video, and then watch the solo bit at the end for a little, a little bit of guide on how to do the solo mode. The game takes place over five rounds, each round having multiple turns within it. Each one of those rounds represents a year of historical time uh, during the, the, the Second World War. As you progress through the game, you get certain cards available at the start of each year. And then as the year progresses, certain other cards become available. And as you progress through the rounds, cards from the previous year become available to buy using uh, build points which allow you to bolster your hand in a way that you choose to play whether you wish to play a bit more defensive, defensively a bit more offensively. So there's a nice little mechanism there for uh, building up the deck of cards that you want to play depending on how your game is going. Let's take a look at the map before I jump into the cards. I've got it zoomed out here so we can see everything and I'll zoom in a little bit closer when we get to certain specific details. But the game really is the Pacific Ocean, the very far west coast of the US there, Australia and then China and um, what was then known as Indochina and Borneo on the uh, left side of the map just here. The map itself is, is point to point and you have a number of different spaces within this, this map. You have purely sea spaces, so these have like a darker green colour, so for example the South Pacific, the Northwest Pacific. You have controlled areas which have sort of a yellow header, so for example the West Coast, Hawaii, Midway, Japan and so on. Some of those areas have a pre-coloured uh, control marker, so for example Iwo Jima here has the Imperial Japanese flag to show that it starts the game controlled by Japan. Uh, Espirito Santo down here has the US flag. The eagle-eyed among you will see the Australian flag here and the British flag there. These are Commonwealth troops and for the purposes of the game they are here primarily for historical flavour. They don't add anything different over and above what the US forces do. They're essentially interchangeable. There are then uh, hexes which have red text and some with little symbols on here, little sort of circles. These are victory hexes and I'll jump into the victory condi conditions shortly so you can see what they are when we do them in a little bit more detail. But essentially the aim of the game is to win early as the Japanese uh, with a decisive victory or the game is to take as much of the um, territory back as you possibly can and force the Japanese back as the Americans. So there's a couple of different ways to win for both sides and I'll go into those in a bit more detail a bit later on. We have uh, infantry, we have land and sea based air forces, we have uh, carrier fleets which are hidden here somewhere, carrier fleets, and then we have uh, regular naval fleets as well. There's uh, a turn order which is determined by the cards in 1941. Japan goes first and is, is somewhat stronger in the naval field than the, the Americans. But as you flip it over through 1942, 1943, slowly but surely that strength and initiative moves more towards the US as you would probably expect in a game like this. Okay, that's the overview. The detail as ever is quite something to grapple on a video like this. So as I go through, although this is a relatively simple war game, please do bear in mind that this is intended to give you a sense of the flow of the game, whether you would enjoy playing it, and really just a, as a little guide to the game rather than exhaustive detail on every single rule in the game. As ever, and as, as sadly so often the case with war games, the rulebook did 
have a tendency to give me a headache. And so I've resulted to finding a uh, summary of the rules and a player aid on Board Game Geek, where some nice person has helpfully summarized both the rules and also uh, post publication uh, errata and so on into that one document. So you'll see me flicking between two documents during the game. I've zoomed right in and we're going to take a look shortly at the different components in the game and what everything does. The aim of the game though is to win, as you might expect, and you do this in a few different ways depending on which side you're playing. I am going to have to read the fan-made player aid for this, but basically there's a couple of different ways. There's an automatic victory. Both sides can score an automatic victory. It's at a certain point with the play, in the Americans' case, of a certain card. So for the Japanese, at the end of 1942, so that's the second round, the Jap Japanese need to control all of their own starting areas. So that's these ones here with the Japanese flag on, like Iwo Jima, Japan, Okinawa, plus all of the, the other victory hexes that have really this sort of small symbol here. So that's Wake Island, Midway, the Aleutians, uh, Singapore, Borneo, and there may be another one somewhere, I'm not sure. But basically they need to control a set number of areas plus their own areas at the start of, or at the end of 1942. For the US, that's slightly different. The US have uh, a card which represents the dropping of the atomic bomb, which is here. And you can play this card as a regular card, but the main reason for playing it is um, you would end the game with it. Now you end the game if you control all of the land areas on the map. So that's basically everything that's not the sea. So the US has to control everything except Japan. And then they can end the game with a decisive victory by playing the atomic bomb card. In addition to those automatic victory conditions, both sides have at least one way of winning the game uh, without the play of the card or, or controlling certain things at certain times. So at the end of the game, if the Japanese control Japan, Okinawa, plus any one of um, the Philippines, uh, the Aleutian Islands, which is actually off map at the top here, um, uh, or Iwo Jima, which is obviously there, they win a decisive victory. So there's two different ways of getting a decisive victory for the Japanese, one with the end of 1942 and then one at the end of 1945 through controlling Japan, Okinawa and at least one of, those, one of those other areas. The Japanese can also win a standard victory if they prevent the US from winning their the game using their victory condition. And so basically the Japanese just have to hold on to Japan, Okinawa and any one other place to score a regular victory. The US have to control all the land areas on the map, except for Okinawa and Japan to win the game. I've set the map up uh, for the campaign game. It's not all visible right now, um, but this is the setup for the, the campaign game. What you would do is you would take your cards for the, for the year, which in this case is 1941, um, and then you would basically begin playing. At the start of the game, the Japanese must do the Pearl Harbor attack, which is essentially play this card and then fulfill the Pearl Harbor attack by rolling two dice, referencing this table. So that's the start of the game. That's the way the game always starts. What happens after that start is very much up to the the players. And this game has a lot of historical accuracy within it, but it's not a strict simulation in the same way that many games are. So for example, the islands of Pelelau may never be invaded by anyone during the game. Not likely to happen, but it's possible. So it's definitely more of a game than a simulation. So bear that in mind as we go through as well. Um, but in terms of the pieces, let's look at the pieces on the map because they're going to be very important as we go through. So there's, there's four different types. As I said at the beginning, there's infantry, land, air, naval, air, um, which is essentially the carrier fleets, and then the regular fleets. Now these counters are two-sided in most cases, um, but when you have multiples, you can just use a single 
counter to represent those multiples rather than using multiple counters. So it helps keep the stacking density low. For example, this is a fleet. It has, says a five on it. Now that five just means that there are five, carry, uh, five fleet units within that one counter. Um, here we have a C air with um, a three, just means there are three C air units in that counter. And you can represent the same number of counters on the board using an individual single counter. So for example, three of, um, when I find one, three of, let's just pretend, three of these planes here um, would equal three regular planes. Obviously we have two different sides there, but three single unit counters is the same as one counter with a label of three. It's not strength, it's nothing like that. It's just how many of them are in the stack. The infantry is slightly different in that it has uh, a second side. So here we have the regular side. Again, this is a single infantry unit, but on the reverse side, it is entrenched as a slightly better defense. That's what that circle is. So there again, there are no steps or anything like that in this game, simply a straightforward uh, one unit or the unit stack value, and then whether or not the unit is entrenched. Land air looks very, very similar to the naval air, but there's a small runway in the very, very corner. I'm not even sure if you can see it on the screen, but there's a very, very small runway there, which shows that it's land air. Compare that with the naval. Uh, the naval unit has sort of three dots on it there and a small picture of an aircraft carrier. And those aircraft carriers um, look a little bit like this. We have uh, three, again, three aircraft carrier units in that one counter. And what you'd normally do at the start of the game is you'd stack each uh, aircraft carrier with the right number of, of planes on it. So that would be a, a fully available um, aircraft unit or a CV unit as they're known in the game when you have the same number of planes and boats together. You do not have to have a cat, you know, those same number throughout the game. Some of those air, some of those aircraft may be lost. You may have three carrier units, but only one plane. That just means that two of them have lost their air capacity and they would need to have their capacity rebuilt during the game. We'll come on to that as we go through. However, if you have one aircraft carrier, you cannot have three uh, plane units on there. The two of those three plane units would have to find another home or they would be lost due to having nowhere to land. So there's a couple of nuances there with the aircraft carriers. This all makes sense uh, as we move further on. Um, finally, we have the regular fleets. So these again have the volume of units on, on in the stack, but then on the reverse, they have a sort of a sunken damaged side. So this is where you do have a step loss for the, the naval fleets, not for anything else, just the naval fleets. And that really is everything in the game in terms of counters. Infantry, fleets, carrier fleets, and land, um, land-based airfields. That's it. So it's really, really straightforward. You do have, however, a different type of infantry. This is the Filipino guerrillas, or a, or a unit representing Filipino guerrillas. Now these are a specific type of, of um, infantry. That are, that are only located in the Philippines and they're only introduced in the game through uh, card play. They don't, they're not there at the beginning. They sort of come on through the game should you choose to play them. But they are, they're sort of a special type of unit there. They don't have an entrenched side. We then have a few different things here. For example, we have these control markers, which is fairly straightforward. You have the Americans and the um, Japanese. By convention, the uh, British equivalent and the Australian equivalent for the American flag is available, um, but it doesn't represent anything different to what the American flag here does in the terms of the game. Um, similarly, um, if you have forces from the same side, uh, typically you would have the Japanese on one side and the Americans or Commonwealth on the other. Uh, it's usually the left side for the Japanese and the right side for the Americans. Um, okay. 
The only other thing on the map is to show you is right at the very top, and that is the build point track. I'm not sure if you can see that there, right at the very top. We have this track. This is the number uh, of production or the amount of production the Japanese have. The Americans have a flat rate 15 build points at the end of every turn. The Japanese have a variable number of build points based on whether they have had card play against them that has reduced their build points, whether they have captured the Philippine, uh, Singapore and Borneo, which would increase their build points. So let's take a look at the cards. I'm just going to pick a couple of cards up. Let's just pick some of these some of these Japanese cards up from the bottom of the screen here. So we have 1942. We've got a few cards from 1942. It's quite shiny, so but hopefully you'll be able to see. So on the cards, we have a few things. We have the year they first become available, a letter which represents their um, use in this solo mode, and then a cost. Now the cost is the cost to purchase at the end of the year from 1942 onwards. Then we ha we also have um, at the top there, we have the, the name of the card and the number right at the very, very top is just the number of the card uh, in terms of the game. It doesn't have any gameplay effect. What we do have though will be a series of instructions. So here we have activate one area for movement, attack one area, pass the turn, and then there's a note there about extra dice if the Japanese fleet are involved. Now what this means is you would, in order, activate an area for movement, attack one area, and then you would pass the gameplay to the other player. Pass the turn is quite a confusing statement, I find. It doesn't mean you pass your go. You're not quitting the round. You're just passing over to the next person to play a card. Um, I'll get into how passing properly works shortly. Um, and then when you do the attack, you can apply the effect. And we have something similar here. We, we have uh, fortifications, 1942. The D represents the solo assistant again cost of one to build the, build the thingy. Um, and here we have place an entrenched marker on friendly controlled area and then attack one area and then pass the round, it should really say, or, or the card play. Um, so here you would again, you would place and then you attack and then you choose to pass. You do not have to do everything, but you must do them in order. That's important. Some cards um, give you an option. So here, for example, we have the Tokyo Express, which says um, move up to two infantry to an area from an area up to two areas distant, ignoring the presence of any US fleets, which essentially is saying you can make a regular infantry move, but ignore the rule that says you cannot move through an area with a fleet. The other option on the card, though, is to attack or amphib one area. Now, attack and amphib are two different types of attack, really, two different types of combat. Um, so you can either do this, use this card for movement or you can use it for combat and then in either case you would then pass the turn. Some cards do give you the option to play another card, for example this one in the American deck which gives you um, an instruction of what you do with the card this turn uh, and then you can either play another card or pass the turn. So it's, it's usually one card per player but there is the option sometimes to play two and you pass that card play between each other uh, as you move through the game. Now, the usual typical round would be one player plays a card, next player plays a card. The other player ha has an option to pass. So if you, if you don't want to play, you don't have to play a card, you can pass. And there are reasons why you would do that. But when both players pass, that is when the round or the year is over. So you can tactically choose to pass, um, but bearing in mind when both of you pass in consecutive goes, the, the round is over. Any cards that you have left in your hand when you pass, stay in your hand for the next year. So what do you do with all these different cards? Well, there's a few different concepts. And again, I'm going to have to reference the, the um, rules here. Uh, just a bit of shuffling in the background probably and so but basically what you tend to do is you tend to activate areas rather than units so for example um, you can activate truck if that's how you say it 
for movement. And that's one of your options. You can move with your, your, your use your cards for movement. So what you can do is you can break up this group here by sending perhaps one to the Solomon Islands. Perhaps you want to um, leave a unit behind and then send another infantry off to the Marianas. That's fine, that's absolutely fine. And in fact, you could even move that unit all the way back to Iwo Jima because the distance you can move pretty much anything is two spaces. But what you can't do with infantry is you cannot move to an uncontrolled area and you cannot move to a controlled area uh, belonging to the other side. You have to use the amphib uh, combat attack to do that in both cases. So movement, very simply, is moving your infantry anywhere within two spaces that you control. It's moving your fleets two spaces, pausing when you come across an enemy fleet, or moving your um, moving your CV units, your aircraft carriers, again two spaces, having to pause for fleets. So fleets really do act as a barrier to movement. What we haven't covered in there is aircraft movement. Now aircraft movement, um, it's two different things you can do really. You can move your CV. You, if you move your aircraft carriers, your planes go with them. That makes sense. And they follow the same movement rules as fleets. Two spaces, that's stopping when you get to an enemy fleet. The land-based air is slightly different. Now, for example, this one down here, if you can see that, probably not, but we have a land-based air unit here. You can move that anywhere that you control Perhaps you want to move it to Hawaii uh, within the movement permitted by the card. If you activate Brisbane, you can move the units according to their own movement rules, including moving the air, the land-based airfield anywhere you like that you control, but you cannot use it again on its uh, that use of the card play. It has to flip over and to show that it's moved. It, has, it takes a bit of time to move those airfields. So that's movement. Some subtleties between the way the different movements use move, but basically, generally speaking, uh, it's just a case of moving things around the, around the map, um, being aware of fleets and the unit type. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can use a card to entrench. That simply means flipping over the required infantry um, to its entrenched side. Now, what happens when somebody moves in to that entrenched side? Let's say if we've moved this unit here, it would flip over and it would just become two entrenched units. So it's really quite a simple defensive thing that you do. You don't activate in an area to be entrenched. It's a unit or a selection of units or a stack of units to be entrenched. Um, while we're on the subject of movement and mentioning stacking, stacking is five uh, of any one type. So, for example, you could potentially have five infantry, five fleets, five aircraft carriers, five planes in the same area. Unless there is a restriction that says otherwise, for example, wake, you're only allowed one infantry, midway two, the illusions two, and so on. There's not very many of those in the game, but there's a few little ones just to be aware of. The only unit that doesn't really follow the stacking rules is the Filipino guerrillas, which do not count against stacking. So as the US player, you could have five infantry in the Philippines and then guerrillas as well. We've covered movement and entrench, which are non-combat actions. The other two main actions you'll take using the cards is attack and amphib, both of which are combat actions. The key difference between them is that one relates to bringing infantry onto a space where there are no friendly infantry currently. So that is the amphib action, and that's essentially an amphibious invasion of an area, so like an, an attack from the sea. Uh, let's start with attack, because there's a few different nuances in all the different the ways the, these attacks work. This is where some of the subtleties in the game come in. So if we have, for example, a naval fleet against naval fleet here in the Solomons, you would simply roll some dice and, and do some damage. That's really how it works. The whole game is based around rolling this pile of dice here and applying hits. Um, the way it works, though, is you activate areas not units. So for example, like with the movement action, where you activate an area and then people move out. With the attack action, you can activate an area for combat and then you can bring things in, uh, mostly aircraft. 
the way combat works is you'll activate the area and then use dice to represent the damage done in, in the combat. Let's start with this potential combat here. We have the US and the Japanese both with fleets in that area. It's just one fleet. And so what you'll do is you'll roll a number of dice for each of the, the fleets. We only have one, so it'll be a one dice per side. And then you'll do damage based on whether you've rolled a four or five or a six. So in this case, the Japanese have scored a four, so that's one damage. The um, Americans have only rolled a two, so that's no damage. So the damage will go on this unit here. For naval combat only, the losing side in terms of number of hit points has to retreat. And the way retreats work is they essentially just move back to an area that does not contain enemy fleets. Other types of combat do not have quite the same, same rules regarding retreats. It's possible also to retreat before combat. So let's pretend for a moment we have a whole bunch of things attacking that one fleet. If we roll a die, on a roll of a three, they can retreat. Uh, obviously, we have to fight there with a the two, but you can retreat if you roll a three or higher. So there's a couple of different things with the Navy involving retreats, but essentially it's roll dice based on the number of fleets that you have and apply the hits, loser retreats. That's essentially how it works. Now, that's in a very basic form. I've moved in this uh, aircraft carrier here. Now here we have a dice for the fleet uh, on both sides, but the aircraft carrier will bring in extra dice. Depending on the point in the game we're at, that dice will change. So at the start of the game, uh, Japanese naval air units roll two dice per unit. So it'll be three against one. Now this is probably where you do want to move out if you're the American player. Um, bearing in mind though, that naval fleets can attack one space away. So even if you do retreat, the air will still get to those guys and you'd still have a roll of two against that fleet. Now there's no air cover necessarily in terms of friendly fleets or, or friendly aircraft carriers or friendly air for that, that naval fleet there. So it would roll a single dice doing a damage. Um, and that's really how combat works. Uh, so we have the ability of aircraft to support naval combat and a variable number of dice depending on the year and which side is, is, is playing. If we had, for example, the same situation, but we have a fleet, um, an aircraft carrier and a plane here, both the fleet, the aircraft carrier and the land-based air, which is here, one away, can still attack. So planes can attack at one away, whether or not they are um, land-based or naval air. Now the difference is if the aircraft carrier gets destroyed, that naval air is going to have to find a new home. Uh, and if it doesn't, it will also be lost. A new home would simply be a friendly aircraft carrier with space, either in the same area or within one area away. The other difference between them is naval air units, unless a car says otherwise, can only attack naval units. Land-based air can attack naval units and infantry. When I say naval units, I do mean aircraft carriers or fleets. And these things can happen multiple times. Now, what would happen typically is you may have perhaps aircraft carriers here, you may have a land air there, you, you, may, you may have other things dotted around. Now, let's um, say for a moment, that we have, do you have this situation? We have aircraft carriers and defending air, and you then have this um, attack here in this area, in the, in the Solomons, between this, uh, this fleet and this aircraft carrier. It would still be five dice plus the one for the Americans because aircraft are only used in defense when they're in the same area as the attack that's happening. So they cannot defend from a distance, but they can support an attack from a distance. Infantry is slightly different. So let's just pretend for a moment that the, the infantry are here. We do have some fleets on both sides. Now, you 
infantry uh, typically can only attack infantry. Land-based air can attack infantry, but regular air and fleets cannot. Combat would work exactly the same way. Now, infantry would roll one each in this case, but the um, entrench would ignore the first result. So that's actually pretty rubbish for att pointless attacking for the the um, Americans there. But let's say they brought in their, their land-based air as well. And we'll say that it's late in the game and the land-based air is rolling two for the Americans. So I'll have two for that land-based air, one for the soldier, nothing for any of the fleets. And so then it would be three versus one, ignoring the first hit because they're entrenched and there's no damage done there, which means the combat will just continue in the next card play. Each area can only be activated for combat once per card. So even if it says activate three areas for combat, you can only, attack, only activate one area at a time, separate areas for combat. Amphib is slightly different. How does Amphib work? Let's pretend for a moment we've got an entrenched unit for the Japanese and the Solomons, a fleet and a navy, uh, aircraft carrier and a fleet and a, a land-based air there. We want to bring in our, tr our soldiers, our two infantry, um, into this place here to do an infantry attack. Now, currently we cannot because we have a Japanese fleet. So unless we use our fleets or our air from a distance to destroy that fleet, we cannot do an amphib. When you do attack like attack like this with multiple potential targets, you say, for example, we're using the aircraft to attack uh, the fleets. The, the aircraft would roll, but then you, the player being attacked gets the choice of how to assign hits, unless it's a six. So for example, if the Americans were to attack here with the aircraft carriers, you might have, let's say, a bunch of dice, but for general uh, purposes of this example, well, maybe we've rolled a six for the land-based air, a five and a four. The first thing that would happen is the CV unit would get hit because a sixes in a naval combat have to go on the aircraft carriers. The other dice would then by default attack and destroy the aircraft. And then finally the last one would go on the fleet. Now, if it was this result, the defending player, so the Japanese, would have the choice of whether or not to assign any of those hits to their aircraft carrier. They could say, okay, I'll take off the plane and I'll destroy destroy that, but I'll keep the aircraft carrier. So it's, it's really um, quite challenging, or can be quite challenging to get rid of the fleets when they're blocking an area. But once you do, once you do get rid of those defending fleets, you can then do an amphib. And so let's say we're going to do an amphib. An amphib, you need a card to do it. It can't be any card that says attack. It has to say amphib. So for example, the Pearl Harbor card here says attack or amphib. You have to have the word amphib to be able to do it. And basically what you'll do is you'll move your um, infantry in. Again, this can be anywhere within two, so long as they um, are able to, able to reach the island. Um, and the card that you play limits the number of soldiers you can move in. So let's say, for example, if I can find one. Um, so here we have a card that says Amphib one area. Now, the total number of infantry that can Amphib into there is the card build cost, which is two plus one. So in this region here, using that card, we can only ever bring a maximum of three infantry in as part of an Amphib attack. When you do the amphib, you can, as the attacking player, you can have um, naval support brought in, um, naval air support, which are assumed to be doing airstrikes, uh, and they can be used in the attack. Defending, you have to have the land-based air in the area, and they can also be used in, in the defense of, of the island. The, the uh, aircraft carrier there wouldn't be used. So there's lots of little nuances around combat, but basically at the end of it, what you're hoping to achieve is the removal of the infantry and then the um, control of the area 
would go to the winning side. It's only infantry that control areas. It's not aircraft carriers or air or anything like that. It's just the infantry. And control is whichever infantry unit was last in the region. Which means basically, if they move out, they will stay in control, or the Americans will stay in control of the Solomons, despite the presence of the fleet. If in a circumstance like this one, where we have US and Japanese, it's a, it's a contested area and there's no control, even though it does say, say Jap Japan's fleet um, imperial flag is there. If you are an infantry unit and you're looking to go into an area that is currently uncontrolled, you can do so with an amphib card, so long as there are no enemy fleets. If there's a presence of an enemy fleet, you basically movement for infantry is, is basically stopped. Um, now, um, once you do move in though, if you're unopposed, you get the automatically control. If you're unopposed except for air, that air unit is removed uh, and you get control. Now, let's say you're locked in a combat. You can amphib more guys in um, using the amphib card. We've talked about the ability to use aircraft carriers in an attack and um, fleets as well, or in an amphib, sorry. And basically what they do in this case is you don't roll per additional unit, you just roll one extra die for their presence in, in the amphibious assault. It's primarily an infantry attack. At the end of each round or each year, when everyone's played their cards, a few things will happen. First thing you'll do is check for supply. And basically supply is two units away or two spaces away from a friendly controlled area. For example, if this unit here um, was within two spaces of the Aleutians when they are controlled by the Japanese, this unit is in supply, it's fine. However, if they were not, they would actually be lost and so would these guys in the Pacific. So these units here would all be lost if there was no Japanese controlled area within two spaces. However, if they were down here, despite the fact that there's a bunch of units here, they would still be within supply of truck because truck is controlled by the Japanese. So it's distance, not um, presence of units that causes loss of units due to supply. Next thing you might wish to do is you may have fleets that are damaged and they can be repaired in Pearl Harbor. They can be repaired in the coasts and for the Japanese, they can be repaired in Japan and truck. There's a limit in Jaria for Japan. It's two fleets in Japan, one in truck. For the US, it's one in Hawaii, two fleets in the West Coast and one fleet in Brisbane. At the end of the year, once you check for supply and you repair your fleets, you will have a pile of discarded cuts. In 1942, you'll just pick up all the cards applicable to 1942, add them to your hand. However, at the end of 1942, when you, when you place the cards in that discard pile there and pick up the 1943 cards, you will have um, the opportunity to buy some of those discarded cards back. And this is where production comes in. So for the Japanese, we've got 1943, and there's not very many cards in 1943. So you have a certain number of points to buy cards from before, and the cost is here. And you can buy as many cards as you can afford with a few exceptions. For example, you cannot buy Midway. You could not buy um, Pearl Harbor. And at certain points, Yamamoto will disappear from the game as well. But basically, if you can afford it, you can then buy cards back into your hand, giving you the opportunity to tailor 1943, 44, and 45 to the style of play you are you are using at that point. When you do get those cards, and let's face it, you may have at the end of it a fistful of cards, right? And there's quite a lot to be using on. So what you'll do is you'll divide those cards into two even piles. One card pile will be set aside. The other will be to start the start the year with. When you're down to one card, you then pick up 
uh, the remaining cards for the year and carry on until you have no cards uh, or you choose to pass and keep some back for the start of the next year. And that is pretty much everything you need to know about playing a game of Pacific Tide. There are some unique cards for both sides. So for example, the Japanese have submarine attacks, which allow you to roll dice to damage fleets. You can place cards from your hand in front of you and then discard them when you're being attacked to, to pro and prevent an attack. And you can um, build up anti-submarine efforts and um, uh, uh, minefields to try and prevent similar things from the Americans. The Americans do have cards that damage or potentially damage this build point track, meaning you can have somewhat less than 10 uh, build points as the Japanese player. You would normally have 10 by default. And that is more or less everything you need to know about playing Pacific Tide two players. For the solo player, you need to know a little bit more about how the game will play uh, using the Solitaire Assistant, which is this card here, which looks rather more complicated than it actually is. Basically what that Solitaire Aid does is it guides you to what card you're going to play uh, for the opposing side um, based on a stance. It has whether it's an aggressive stance, a defensive stance, or a balanced stance. And the stance is represented by these three tokens here, uh, A, B, and D. And at the start of the game, you'll roll the die uh, to see which of those three stances the bot will be at the beginning of the game. When it's the bot's turn to play, you'll have the cards for the year in a stack and you'll reveal them one at a time. Now, these are going to come out slightly strangely because of the way I've just chucked some cards in a pile, but we'll have, I hope, um, a card representing each of the three stances the bot could possibly be. If I just move everybody from the Solomons to one side, we can see that we do have an A, a B and a D card. Now the bot is going to have different priority orders based on whether they are aggressive, balanced or defensive. And so for example, they will always choose their own letter as the priority card to play where that is available. So for example, an aggressive bot will choose Yamamoto's card here, which is an A. A balanced bot will choose the CV build for a B. And the uh, defensive bot will have the Banzai attack card as the card they play. Whichever card it is that gets played will be played as best as you can um, as the player, pushing the other two remaining cards to one side as a discard to play later. Now, each year, um, the bot will have certain things it wants to, to achieve during the game. So for example, Yamamoto here, we are as the player told the bot wants to, um, it wants to activate an area for movement, it wants to attack on every a couple of areas. What areas are they gonna be? Well, if it was 1941, those areas would be the Philippines, Singapore, and Borneo. Um, it might be Midway, Wake, uh, and have a battle in the sea for, um, for, for later years and so on. Now, if it was a defensive bot, that would be slightly different. In 1942, the bot would want to entrench the Marianas. And so depending on the stance and the card, you have to play with certain goals in mind. And while that doesn't replace a, a fully fledged bot or solo AI system like some games have, what it does is it gives you a guide for using the cards to achieve certain goals, to play the best bot game you can against yourself. And that, I find personally that works really, really well because when you play two-handed, you, you, you might have multiple choices to make and you try to, you know, maybe you want the Japanese to win for some reason and you, you know, you play the Americans in a way that will help you let yourself win. This sort of removes that element of ambiguity from, from the card play when you're playing solo and it sort of guides you through. And there are certain instructions for certain cards, but generally speaking, it will tell you which card or which type of card it would prefer to play which type of card it would prefer to play if the most preferred card is not available, and then finally, which type of card it would play as a last resort. Ultimately, though, every card in the bot hand or the bot deck will get played by all three stances. And so you do go through the deck in much the same way as you would uh, as against a player. 
Okay, that is the end of this video. Uh, we have covered everything you need to know to get going with a game of Pacific Tide. Hopefully it has helped you understand the game and has helped you decide whether or not this is a game that you would like to play. As ever, if I've missed anything or if anything is not quite as it should be, please do let me know in the comments. Shared learning helps everybody. In the meantime, though, I do hope you enjoy playing Pacific Tide. I certainly do, and I will see you next time.